Once again, everybody, I am Colin Weaver. These are the IT Dojo CICSP questions of the day, where I ask you two questions at a time to help you, in bite-sized chunks, prepare for that CICSP exam. Let's go. Question number one today comes at you from the world of cryptography, and what I want to know is which of these options is currently considered to be uncrackable? Click pause if you need to. When you got the right answer, click play. Let's talk about it. All right, choice number one on the list, one-time pad. That's the right answer. So we'll knock it out right away. I mean, a one-time pad is considered to be uncrackable. And the reason it is considered to be uncrackable is because there, there's a few reasons why, but the, the, one of the biggest reasons is, is that the key that is used is truly random. Now, truly random means actually generated from true randomness, not generated from some sort of starting seed material or some initial key value that's then used through some sort of a function to go in and create more key material for the size of your message doing you know, key stream generation or something along those lines. Truly random means truly random. Now, cryptographers and things like that will talk, about, talk with you about the complexities of truly generating random data, but suffice to say, in order for a one-time pad to be considered to be uncrackable, it has to use a key that is generated truly randomly. Most keys that we make use of in life today are generated pseudo-randomly, not truly random, but pseudo-random, which I always tell people those pseudo-random basically means kinda random or pretty darn random, but not truly random. Uh, the other thing about one-time pads is that the keys are used exactly once, okay? So we don't reuse the key again ever. The key is used for the transmission of this message and then the key is destroyed. So I encrypt the data using the key, the one-time pad, and then I destroy it, and then the message is delivered to you, you have a copy of the one-time pad that you use to decrypt, and then you destroy the key, and the message has been decrypted, it was encrypted, and now it's decrypted, and the key has been destroyed and is never gonna be used again. The third characteristic of a one-time pad, uh, and this is actually part of what makes it very complicated to go and make use of on a daily basis, is that in order for it to be truly random, uh, it has to also be as long as the message itself. Now, if you were encrypting a single sentence, that might not be the end of the world. In fact, we could potentially go in and do that, and in some cases, in hyper-secure situations, it is done. However, what if you wanted to transmit a you know, six megabyte file? If you want to transmit a six megabyte file, that means you're gonna to have to have a six megabyte key. And that's a obscenely and ridiculously large key to go in and have, but that's what it would take. And the same thing would be true if you wanted to go in, say, and encrypt the entire contents of a hard drive. If you want to go in and encrypt a terabyte of data, you're going to need a key that is one terabyte in length. And so uh, one-time pads lose their practicality when it comes to really large pieces of data. And, and in many respects, it begs the question that if you um, want to encrypt that large amount of data, and you have to get, then take the key and give it to the person on the other side so that they can decrypt it. Um, if you wanted to move a six megabyte file, rather than walking over and giving somebody a six megabyte key so they can decrypt the six megabyte file once and only once, uh, why not just walk them over the file? Okay, kind of deal. So uh, one-time pads have their place, but they're not considered to be terribly practical. But when implemented correctly, they are considered to be uncrackable. And they're uncrackable in perpetuity. So, uh, but that's the answer that you're looking for right here. Next answer on the list is RC572. Uh, nope, not considered uncrackable. Difficult to crack. In fact, if you go to distributed.net and look at their RC572 uh, project, you'll see just how difficult it is to actually crack RC572 because they've been at it for more than a decade and haven't made much headway. Uh, so you should check that out. Link down below. Diffie-Hellman, no. The Vigen Air Cipher. Vigen Air Cipher is just an old school example of a, of a cipher where they had an array of the um, alphabet on both the X and Y axis and would go in and um, uh, match the values up with a, uh, using a key and then the plain text value. Uh, the Vigen Air Cipher was famous because it was one of the first ciphers that allowed you to end up with different cipher text given a particular piece of plain text. But um, modern computer systems would make short work of the Vigen Air Cipher, no time flat. And the, uh, the last one on the list is pbkdf2. Uh, pbkdf2 is the password-based key derivation function. Uh, probably the most notable place where you see pbkdf2 being utilized is in 802.11 wireless LANs because it's involved in the process of generating the pairwise master key that is used to actually uh, create the encryption keys that are going to be used for um, uh, securing your wireless LAN traffic. Uh, 
um, PBKDF2 is, I guess, crackable. It's not really an encryption algorithm per se, but um, uh, but if you were to use PBKDF2 in the context of 802.11 LAN, um, if I have the same values, I can go and generate the pairwise master key that you generate for access to your wireless LAN. So no, that's not a good answer choice either. So again, the only right answer here is a one-time pad. All right, next question today. Which of the following is an example of multi-factor authentication? Now, here's your answer choices. Look at them closely. Click pause. Only one answer is correct. Click pause, and when you're ready, click play. I'll tell you why. All right, first answer up. A split knowledge system, no. A split knowledge system is when this person knows some stuff and this person knows some other stuff and then they do like a one to twins power activate kind of thing and bring it together and now suddenly they have the, the password. Um, that is not considered multi-factor authentication. There's still only one password that controls access to the system. The fact that two people know separate parts of it, that's incidental. So no, that is not considered multi-factor. Second one, a username with an iris scan. So close. Uh, just your username, no. A username plus a password along with an iris scan, that would be multi-factor. But just the username combined with an iris scan, not going to do it. Uh, that's still a single factor mechanism. Next batter up, a smart card and a pen. Yes, that's two-factor. Now, the subtle distinction in the answer here, what makes something two-factor? We generally say that in order for it to be considered multi-factor or two-factor authentication, is it has to be two different types of authentication. And what I mean by that is something you know, something you have, or something you are. Something you know, a password or a pen, something you have, like a smart card, some sort of physical token, and then something that you are would be something biometric related. So in this case, we have two out of three. We know something, a pen, and we have something, a smart card. That is considered multi-factor authentication, 2FA. So that's the answer that we're looking for here. But let's continue to talk about the rest of them, make sure we feel good about why, what's what. Next choice on the list, this one gets people, a password and a pen. You say, well, I know a password, plus I have to know a separate, effectively password, a pen number. Um, this is not technically considered a multi-factor authentication system because it is two of the same. It's two things that you know. And if you look in the links down below, I point to some very specific documentation that, that describes and says that in order for something to be considered multi-factor, it's gotta be two different. So having two passwords is not considered multi-factor authentication. So don't choose that as the answer should you encounter something similar to this on the exam. All right, how about the next one? A passphrase and a captcha challenge. No, um, passphrase, great. That's something that you know. Captcha is more to detect that you're not an automated process or a computer that's trying to do this login that you're actually a human and you've all experienced captcha stuff if you're not familiar with it captcha is like when you go to log into a website and they show you a bunch of images and say you know choose which ones have street signs in them or choose which one has a storefront on it or something along those lines where they they go in and they have you read some you know funky circus looking letters and you have to go in and figure out what the letters are and then type those into a field all this stuff is captcha it's all designed to prevent automated logins uh, from robots and you know just computer processes being able to log into systems. So that's not considered multi-factor authentication. And the last choice, um, I harped on it enough already, knowing a passphrase and a pre-shared key, uh, that's again two things that you know that's not considered multi-factor authentication. So don't do that. The only right answer here is the one that is with a pen and a smart card. All right, sweet. Two more questions down. Again, I'm hoping that these are helping you. Let me know if they are or not by throwing some comments down below or loving on that like button or clicking on the hate button, whichever one it is you want to do. And I'll be back again real soon with some more questions. Bye.